Hi everyone. As I said earlier, my name is Tim Power. I'm one of the pastors here at Salem and I have a reputation for telling dad jokes. Now, what is a dad joke you may ask? Well, I'm actually very glad that you asked. It's like a normal joke, only more painful. See, a dad joke isn't really good unless it elicits a groan from the person you tell it to. Here are a few examples. I don't mean to brag, but cashiers are always checking me out. I went to the museum and I saw a 2,000-year-old stain. It was from ancient Greece. Or, my wife told me to stop impersonating a flamingo. I had to put my foot down. Okay, I think you now know what a dad joke is and why I don't have many friends. As I said, I have a reputation for telling dad jokes. Now, here is my question for you today. What is your reputation? What are you known for? How would you describe yourself or your personality? What stands out and, and maybe just as important, maybe how would other people describe you? I once heard somebody say, protect your reputation, you only get one. Have you ever heard that? And now it's not bad advice, but I wonder how true it really is. Do you really only have one reputation? See, actually, I think we probably have about as many reputations as we have relationships. Probably if I asked one of your friends at work or at school what you're like, they might say that you're really quiet. But if I asked somebody who lives with you, they might say you never shut up. One of my sons is really, really talkative at home. He's full of jokes and stories at the dinner table. But when we talked to his teacher at a parent-teacher conference, they said he almost never talks in class. Same person two different reputations, right? Well, we're in a sermon series right now that is called Flawed and Faithful. We've been spending a few weeks looking at characters in the Bible who are faithful to God even though they didn't live flawless lives or have flawless reputations. So I made this point last week, but it's worth making again. I am a flawed and broken person. I think that's really important for everybody to hear, especially from a pastor, because it's true about every single one of us. Just like we read in Romans 3, 23 through 24, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but all are treated as righteous freely by His grace because of a ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. See, we are all flawed but we can be changed by the amazing love of Jesus. But it's not anything we do that makes us right with God. I think that is so important. See, it's what Jesus already did for us through his death on the cross and his resurrection. Did you know that there is nothing you can do to make God love you more? And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. See, the love of God isn't a reward for change. It's a resource by which we can be changed. See, God wants you and me to change for the better. He does want us to sin less. He wants us to love more. But that's not a prerequisite to him loving us. See, it's a, our response to his love. I'll say that again. The love of God isn't a reward for change. It's the resource by which we can be changed. Now, in the past weeks, we looked at the stories of Moses and Jacob. Today, we're going to look at another character from the Old Testament, a woman named Rahab. Now, by all accounts, she was a woman with a bad reputation, who God chose to use in a big, big way. Now, let me set up the story a little bit before I read today's scripture, which is from the book of Joshua in the Old Testament. At this point in the biblical story, the Hebrew people had been rescued by God out of slavery in Egypt. Now, you probably remember that story. Moses tells Pharaoh to let my people go. And then Charleston Heston leads the people through some parted waters of special effects that have not aged so well. You remember all of that, right? Well, after the Hebrew people leave Egypt, they set out for the promised land. That's the land that was promised to them in the land of Canaan. Now, 
before they try to enter the land, they actually send 12 spies into the land to gather intelligence. Two of the spies come back with a good report. They say, it's everything we've ever dreamed of, and we should go ahead and take the land. But 10 of the 12 spies come back with a negative report and said that the people in the land were too strong and that the Hebrew people would never win and that they shouldn't even really try. So bad news won the day. And the Hebrew people did not enter the promised land until after Moses died and they had a new leader named Joshua. Now, when this new leader Joshua takes power, the first thing he does is to send in some more spies because he knows that you're only as good as your intelligence, right? But if you remember last time, they sent in 12 spies and only two brought back a good report. This time, Joshua seems to have learned his lesson. He only sends in two spies. They sneak into the most powerful city in Canaan. It's a city called Jericho. Now, when they're in this city, they enter the house of a Canaanite woman named Rahab. Now listen, I am going to try my hardest to keep this sermon as PG rated as possible, but I will be reading scriptures that could inspire questions for families with kids to discuss separately. Let me put it this way. If you've ever seen the movie Pretty Woman with Julia Roberts, Rahab shared the same profession as Julia Roberts. Now, why would these spies who were on a mission seeking out military intelligence head right to the house of Rahab? Well, Old Testament scholars tell us that women who were in Rahab's profession would have frequently hosted the military leaders of Jericho. And so she would probably possess a great deal of knowledge that would be important to the Hebrew spies. Now, somehow, the leaders of Jericho found out that the spies had entered Rahab's house. They knock on her door and they ask her to send out the spies, but Rahab lies to them. She tells them that the spies have already left, but if they hurry, maybe they could catch up with them before they leave the city. The leaders of Jericho, they believe her and they rush off to try to catch the spies elsewhere. See, she hid the Hebrew spies, the enemy spies in her home. Now, this is all very surprising to these two Hebrew spies. They wonder why would this Canaanite woman Rahab help them? And before they go to sleep that night, she actually tells them, we read this in the book of Joshua chapter two, eight through 14. Before the spies bedded down, Rahab went up to them on the roof. She said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. Terror over you has overwhelmed us. The entire population of the land has melted down in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Reed Sea in front of you when you left Egypt. We have also heard what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan. You utterly wiped them out. We heard this and our hearts turned to water because of you people can no longer work up their courage. This is because the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now, I have been loyal to you, so pledge to me by the Lord that you in turn will deal loyally with my family. Give me a sign of good faith. Spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, and sisters, along with everything they own. Rescue us from death. The men said to her, we swear by our own lives to secure yours. If you don't reveal our mission, we will deal loyally and faithfully with you when the Lord gives us the land. Now here is what fascinates me when these spies talk to Rahab. She tells them about the reputation that God has in Canaan. She tells them that everyone in Canaan remembers what God did in Egypt, and they all know that God will help the Hebrew people triumph. See, it makes me wonder, did any of those 10 spies who went in the first time, did any of them actually talk to the people in Canaan? Did any of them take the time 
to find out what God's reputation was in Canaan? See, this is actually 40 years later, and the Canaanites are still scared to death of the God of Israel. Think about this. Think about how often do we let negative words, especially false negative words, hold us back from what God is promising us. But it's in verse 11 where we really get to see who Rahab is and what she believes. She says this, This is because the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. See, here we see what motivates Rahab's actions, her fearlessness, her selflessness in hiding and protecting these two Hebrew men. See, she knows that God is God and she's saved because of it. She trusts in God's reputation and actually her own reputation is forever changed because of it. Well, how do I know that her reputation has changed? I actually know that because this is not the last time we hear about Rahab in the Bible. If we fast forward a few hundred years, in the book of James, chapter 2, we encounter Rahab again. In verse 23, it says this, So the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and God regarded him as righteous. What is more, Abraham was called God's friend. So you see that a person is shown to be righteous through faithful actions and not through faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute shown to be righteous when she received the messengers as her guests and then sent them on by another road? Did you hear that? Rahab is mentioned right alongside Abraham for her faith. And did you notice her reputation has actually changed? She's now not defined for the shame of her occupation, but actually she's defined by her righteousness. But it doesn't stop there. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, we have this hall of faith where the author lists name after name of people in the Old Testament who are pictures of incredible faithfulness to God and God's plans and purposes. He lists Abraham, he lists Isaac, he lists Jacob, Moses, and then in verse 31, listen to this. By faith, Rahab the prostitute wasn't killed with the disobedient because she welcomed the spies in peace. What more can I say? I would run out of time if I told you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Now, I want you to take a second and think about this. Did you hear that? The author of Hebrew felt it was so important to mention Rahab, more important even than David, Gideon, or the prophets. But it doesn't even stop there, not even by a long shot. If you go to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, there's this long genealogy of Jesus. And and usually, when I come to it, I skip it, right? We skip the genealogies, the begats. So-and-so begat, so-and-so who begat, so-and-so who is the father of who really cares, right? But sometimes when we read them, we can actually hear God speak. And that's the case here. In Matthew, chapter 1, verse 5, we read this. Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. Now, if you continue reading from King David, the line goes all the way to our Savior Jesus. Do you see that? See, Rahab was such an unlikely person for God to use. She had a bad reputation. She wasn't a Hebrew. She wasn't even born one of God's chosen people, right? She had a profession that was considered sinful even by her own people. But God used Rahab. And here's the part that really blows my mind. God did not ask Rahab to change before he used her. We are not introduced to Rahab as the lady who used to be sinful, got her life in order, and was then used by God. See, That tells me that the love of God isn't a reward for change. It's the resource by which we can be changed. And not only was she a small part of God's people entering the promised land. No, 
this faithful but flawed woman with a bad reputation was used by God to be a descendant of our one true Savior, Jesus Christ. See, God trusts his reputation with the flawed and faithful. He did it with Rahab. He can do it with you. He can do it with me. The love of God isn't a reward for change. It's the resource by which we can be changed. So I would like to give you a chance to respond to this sermon. So what now? Well, I think God really wants to use you as part of his big story. See, when Rahab fully accepted who God was, when she put her faith in the God of Israel, what did she do? Well, she surrendered. Really, she surrendered to the spies, right? She gave up. So that's all you can really do when you see your weakness in God's strength. You could say, God, I entrust my life to you. I entrust my story to you. I entrust my reputation to you. Do with me as you will. Will you pray with me, please? God, we recognize who you are. You are the God in heaven and on earth below. So we give ourselves to you. We want to be a part of your big story. We want our reputation to be not based on our actions, but on what you've already done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Let his righteousness be our righteousness, God. I pray that we could live our lives differently in response to what you have done. I pray that we could be changed, not so that you can love us, God, but because you already have. So God, we seek your face right now. Change us, Lord. Let our hearts be transformed by your amazing love. Do with us what we can't do for ourselves. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.